Hey folks, Pastor Jim Thomas from the Village Chapel here, along with my friend Sam Albury from across the pond over in England, and uh, we are so excited to be able to talk with you tonight and chat together about friendship. Um, anecdotally, I'll just tell you, uh, Sam, Sam and I met uh, through some mutual friends. Uh, uh, most of you from Village Chapel will know the Gettys come to the church. The Gettys called me up one Sunday when they were out of town and said, would you please take our friend James to lunch? He's coming in from England. So uh, Kim and I did. We took James to lunch, and then James that night introduced us to Sam. And, and then I think, Sam, we've had Thai food, what, two or three times since then, along with T.J. Timms from Emmanuel Church. Had a great time together. And We uh, have, yeah. That's been yeah. good fun. Yeah, so uh, there's just a great you know, sort of example of friendship that's beginning to gather around food and, uh, and pretty good food. food especially. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah. I can't wait till you get back over here in the States and you can, I, I've heard about your cooking. I've heard that you make a pretty mean Tom cook soup. So. Yeah. It's my favorite thing to make. So, um, as soon as your country lets me back in, I will cook you some Thai soup. That'd be fun. Motivation well, for you to pray for me to come back. There you go. There you go. Well, um, Sam, let's talk for just a minute uh, as this whole COVID thing has gone on and on and on. I think a lot of folks have felt uh, uh, not only isolated, but perhaps even becoming a little bit disoriented in their, um, I mean, sometimes it happens to me as well. I wake up and I go, is this Tuesday or Saturday? I can't really remember. And since I've been recording sermons, Sam, I'm, I can't remember the last time I was, you know, uh, back here in this building. It's so great to, to, to have this sense of our space here again, but, um, but it's been a long time. And so disorientation is a bit of what's happening to, to me and maybe to you as well with our, with our friendships. We're not able to see people or to, 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 to shake hands or to hug or whatever. And, uh, I'm sure you're, you're, I've noticed on Instagram, you're, you're taking great walks in the morning and, uh, but you're able to see some friends and connect, I would think. Yeah, we still have quite a few restrictions here in the UK at the moment. Um, and they're just beginning to tighten them again, sadly. Um, but it's meant you, you can have some limited contact with friends. Typically, if it's outside, it's much easier and, and freer. So it being summer, it's been a, a bit drier. So I've been making the most of being around the English countryside and trying to hike with some friends as well. It's it's actually one of my favorite ways of catching up with someone is just to go for go for a long walk and uh, just put the world to rights. But I think you're right. It's been... I found it very disorientating, partly because of, as you say, I feel like I need a daily bulletin on what day of the week it is. Um, part of me still thinks it's March. Um, mm. I'm told it's actually May now, right? We're in May, is that right? Um, <laughs> I, I think we're in September. Uh, I hope we are. <laughs> what year? <laughs> anyway, I'm preparing uh, for so my September so sermons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it just sort of feels like that the usual sort of shape and and kind of geography of time has has kind of gone out the window. And yeah. like you said, I think it. For, I mean, many of us, if we've had any contact with others at all, it's been obviously with with a much smaller circle of people. Some of us, temperament wise, will love that. Others of us will struggle with that. Mm. But um, I feel like there are some very key relational muscles. I've just not been using for many months and that feel very atrophied. So I know that when I'm, when I'm back in a, a big crowd and having to do small talk, I find that hard anyway, but I think mm. that will feel like I'm starting from scratch. So um, uh -huh. I, think, I think I'll be doing baby talk for a little while before we kind of get back into things. Well, I can make up, I'll, I assure you, I'll make up the difference on all the shallow talk that we need here in our conversation today because I'm shallow. And, uh, <laughs> but I'm, 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 uh, I'm happy to, to be able to chat with you about this because I know as, I've, as we've come to know each other just a little bit uh, that you've got some really deep and wonderful relationships, friendships with uh, other pastors, uh, friendships uh, that we have in common with, uh, with, with the Gettys and the like and James. And um, I, I, watch, um, I watch the way people interact with one another. And uh, it, it seems like uh, friendships can be uh, really uh, beautifully complex. 
Uh, not only can you have a good laugh, but you can also get to the point of where you're able to share some some deep things with others as well. How would you uh, how would you characterize friendship as you've experienced it yourself uh, o- over the last uh, few years, say pre-COVID as well? And 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 what are sort of the high marks of friendship for you? Yeah, friendship is something I've. I, I just care very deeply about all of us need it obviously mm-hmm. so it's not as if it's a you know optional extra we're designed for it um but being being unmarried friendship is has sort of been my primary means of of you know relational intimacy of company that kind of thing so it's even more precious to me it's it's something of a lifeline um yeah. And I think for me, I, I love, uh, we'll, we'll quote C.S. Lewis, I'm sure, many times in this interview, but he talks, um, I can't remember where possibly his book, The Four Loves, but he talks about friendship being created when one person says to another, what, you two? I thought I was the only one. So there's that sense of friendship is often when you realize you're seeing the world in the same way that someone else is, you, you kind of both have the same angle on reality. That's right. And so for me, two features of friendship I particularly cherish, therefore, is one is laughter, because if you both find the same things funny, that's not insignificant. And, you know, there's that awkward experience of when you think something is hilarious and no one else in the room does at all. So there's something of a a cathartic relief to have Mm. someone else who who sees the same type of absurdity that you see in, in the world. So that that's one mark of that having a shared perspective. And I think the other one is where you can be honest and you can share what's what's really going on in your life. You don't feel you've got to to cover up yourself and hide yourself. Yeah. So I think both of those things actually are flip sides of the same feature, which is that that kind of that trust and sense that I can I can be myself with this person and it's going to be OK. Yeah. Sam, talk about, go back to something you said a little bit earlier there. Uh, We were designed for this, uh, for friendship, for relationship. Uh, This really runs all the way back to sort of our original creation design, Mm -hmm. right? And the Imago Dei. Um, Yeah. Talk talk about that for just a second and what you mean by we were created or designed for this. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's such a, a precious beautiful truth and it's it's there in page one of the bible you know when when god comes to make a being in his image he emphasizes his own plurality so we hear let us make man in our image not let me make man in my image but let us there's a there's a plurality to god that we as the bible unfolds we understand eventually is is the doctrine of the trinity but it, it, it's accenting the very fact that the god who is making us in his image is himself relationship and so we are persons made for relationship in the image of a god who is persons in relationship and one of the mistakes i think we've made in our our culture in the western world is that we've taken the concept of relationship and the concept of intimacy and we've we've kind of funneled all of it into the category of romance and part of one of you know one of the things we need to do in the in the christian world for sure and and more widely in our society is recapture the vision for friendship um friendship is meant to be a fundamental way we fulfill that image of god humanness and relate to one another so it's not meant to be just well, you have your romantic partner and that's that's your kind of all of your relational needs met. That's that's certainly a very significant part of that. But mm. um, that wider category of friendship, I think we've we've seriously downplayed and it, it's it's not done us good to do that. Yeah. So, Sam, in your book, The Seven Myths of Singleness, you talk a little bit about friendship. Uh, I wonder if you could just give us a, a brief overview of some of the insights you've got there. I mean, we want people to buy the book, of course, but but uh, uh, whet our appetite for some of the things you talk about when you talk about friendship there. Yeah, there's, there's lots of things. Um, one of my favorite verses, and I think it's so foundational for how we think about friendship, is is John 15, verse 15, and it's... It's one of those verses I genuinely would not believe were it not for the fact that it really is in the Bible. And 
Jesus says to his disciples, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. Mm. But I've called you my friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. And basically, Jesus is, is defining what he thinks friendship consists of. And it's disclosure. He says the reason the disciples are now friends is because all that Jesus has received from the father, he's made known. In other words, Jesus is saying, you are friends with me now because I've let you in. I've let you in on what's really going on. And in fact, Jesus is saying he's let us in on everything that's going on. So the friendship is the person, the, the real friend is the person you can spill the beans to. Um, the person who actually knows what's really going on in your life. And I think that is what is so significant. That is, I think in in, in biblical terms, I think that is intimacy. Yeah. Uh, people knowing what's actually happening in our lives. It yeah. uh, doesn't have to have anything to do with, with sex and romance at that point. It's mm-hmm. just a sense of being being known and loved and accepted by somebody else. And that's the marvel and the wonder of it all, too, that he knows us fully and and yet still loves us like he does. It's it's just remarkable. And again, the, the more honest I think we get with ourselves and start to see that sort of thing, um, the more we're led into a place of wonder and worship. Um, talk to about, um, you, you mentioned C.S. Lewis earlier, and we'll post that quote up on the screen as well. Um, when one person says to another, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. Um, this happened with us, yeah, with with, uh, yeah. with the mutual friends, with the mutual food that we enjoy and having a good laugh. And at the same time, uh, I remember the first time uh, I saw you, actually, uh, Sam, was at uh, a conference you were speaking at, and you were, uh, there were there were a host of speakers. But I'm a, I'm a guy that really loves exposition. I just love mm-hmm. to teach through books of the Bible. And uh, at that particular conference, which will remain nameless, but I mean, you were one of the few guys that actually opened the Bible and went through verse by verse and sort of went through this passage <clears throat> and I just so appreciated it because our uh, our our common love for God's word and our mm-hmm. common love for that particular approach to teaching is so, so, what, what sort of drew me to want to know. I want to know this guy, you know. I, I, yeah. I want to know this guy. I wonder if our friendships, and as you think about your own friendships, Sam, are they really uh, about us or are they about something else, like a common interest or 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 the gospel or something? Is there? Is it often about something other than the two persons? I think it often is. And I I half love and half don't quite fully agree with Lewis on this point. Okay. Um, Because he talks about friendship primarily being side by side, shoulder to shoulder, Mm. whereas, you know, two lovers are face to face. Um, I'd I'd want to say there's it's not that the face to face component is entirely absent from friendship. In other words, when, when you and I get together, we don't just talk about biblical exposition. Right. Um, and I read, I read Curry, though <laughs> glorious both of those things are. Um, yeah. You know, well, I'll ask you how you're doing and, and yeah. how things are going at church, how, how your ministry is, how your life is. And that's it would be weird if that aspect was entirely missing from from yeah. our interactions. Yeah. And actually, interestingly, with Lewis, it's there's what he says about friendship. And then there's the actual friendships he models to us. If you read through his letters, they are far more personal Mm -hmm. than you would probably get the impression he would be if you just read what he says about friendship. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a bit of both. It's often some common shared love, interest, task that that kind of draws you together, that sense of relief of finding Mm -hmm. someone who gets it whatever it happens to be but it, it grows beyond that doesn't it to be actually you yeah. you care about the other person and you 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 get to know each other well along those lines then uh, i want to post a little quote from jc ryle friendship halves our troubles and doubles our joys he said so um <clears throat> how do you how do you find that uh, to be true in your own relationships uh, how do they uh, half your troubles and then maybe how do they double your joys what 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 would your answer be to that yeah yeah i love that quote that that is so that resonates so deeply and there's something about you know 
there's the old adage that a problem shared is a problem halved or something mm. to that effect. And there's a lot of truth to that, isn't there? When you, you're going through something serious and painful, to have people come alongside you that you deeply trust and who you know will understand you and, and support you and encourage you, mm. that makes the world of difference. And, you know, actually one of the most, I think, deepest pains we ever go through is is isolation and so trials where we can have good companionship through our trials that makes just a world of difference uh, not to have to suffer on our own um, yeah. and similarly with the joys you know we're told in scripture to to rejoice with those who rejoice but when you when you already have a deep friendship with someone you don't need to be told that you've you've so kind of you're so attuned to their emotional well-being that when they're hurting, you're already hurting with them. And when they're rejoicing, you're already rejoicing with them. Mm. Um, we, we kind of affect each other at, at that kind of level. And yeah. again, that's a, that's a sweet, a sweet blessing. I think it really is. Um, <clears throat> talk about just a little more on the quality of friendships. And uh, 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 if we could, um, as we, seek to establish good friends and maintain good friendships. Uh, we also, I think, would want to be thinking about what kind of friend we are ourselves to others. Yeah. Um, I think we've probably all been around people who, when they chat with us, they it's it's about them, and then it's about their career, and then it's about m more about them. But they're never asking you, as you just said a moment, moment ago, well, how are you? You know, um, yeah. can you have too many friends or or maybe they're not really friends at that point if you if, if they're just on that sort of acquaintance level and small talk as you were saying earlier but uh can can a person have so many uh as proverb says that they that you kind of come to ruin if you will or you you're separated you're hmm. divided up you're compartmentalized you're you're shredded uh has that ever happened to you do you do you find that to be true how, how many good friends can we actually yeah. have yeah well, it, it, a lot of that will, will depend on our own situation, but I, I think you're exactly right. Um, it's possible to have a high number of very superficial friendships, which are not actually real friendships in the biblical way of thinking about it. There may be people that we share a hobby with or have some kind of surface level interaction with. But in terms of the kind of person who actually you disclose your real self to, I think that takes the kind of investment and time and intentionality that means it can't happen with with lots and lots and lots of people. So if you've got 500 friends of, on Facebook, what you have 500 of is not really that kind of friend. Right. It's just people who know you and you know them and you have a bit of access to what each other's up to. So in terms of how many, I think this is where I've thought a lot about where singleness can be a particular opportunity. Um, I think when you're married, Lord willing, you have a depth of intimacy with that one particular person that is obviously unique and you don't have that kind of intimacy with anybody else approaching even. Um, and that's obviously a, a type of intimacy I, I won't be experiencing as a, as a single person. But on the flip side, I think as a single person, there can be a breadth of intimacy that I can enjoy Mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have the capacity for if I was married. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, the greatest blessings to me of singleness has been able to invest in quite a range of very deep friendships. And I think of really good friends of mine who are my age, I think of good friends of mine who are 20 years older or, or 10 years younger, and I've got the capacity for that in a way I, I, I wouldn't have Mm -hmm. If I was married, it's a different kind of intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not as fully known by any one of them as you would be by Kim. But at the same time, there's, there's a sort of breadth to it that is very precious as well. Having a, a range yeah. of people who really do know me very, very well and, and care for me. That's so good. Do you think the church, uh, how do you think the church has done uh, in terms of uh, nurturing uh, or uh, sort of encouraging friendship along like this. We, 
we we certainly have a lot of emphasis on marriage. We have a lot of emphasis on child rearing, child bearing, and child rearing, and and sort of that family unit like that, the nuclear family. Um, it seems to me, and I'm a married person saying this. I don't have any children, but I'm a married person saying this. It seems to me that we would do better to, or or, may, or maybe we just haven't done well enough talking about friendship. Um, uh, particularly, and I, I can only speak from my own experience, between brothers, you know, between between mm -hmm. men. But perhaps the same thing could be said uh, uh, between women as well, women to women. But, you know, do you, do you think that we need to reintroduce more conversation on this level? Uh, I, I sense you do. So. I do, yeah, I do. Um, and it will vary from, from church to church. Yeah. Um, but I think generally... The cultural narrative has been one in which friendship has been very much downgraded and romantic sexual intimacy has been very much kind of put to the foreground. Yeah. And sadly, I think that's been reflected in our churches quite a lot too. There's there's the kind of understanding that the basic unit of the church is the, is the nuclear family. And I know too many churches where if you're not married... Um, and not part of a nuclear family. You don't really have any means of, of deep friendship and intimacy within the church family. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to recover the lost art of friendship in many of our churches. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the need for, for churches to teach on marriage and to run events strengthening marriages as a single person i have a stake actually in the marriages of my church being healthy yeah. but i don't think i've ever heard any churches doing workshops on how to have healthy friendships mm. so i think it's tricky if, if we're sort of implying that the only real way of finding intimacy in our church is through through being married then that's going to cause us a lot of problems um it's going to make for, for one it's going to make the christian sexual ethic look very untenable for a lot of a lot of people in our in yeah. our culture That's right. um and it's going to cause a lot of loneliness not just for those who aren't married but actually i know married people who are lonely because mm. actually they need friendships outside the marriage as well That's so right. it's not just we need friendship for the sake of the singles we need friendship for all of us i've seen some marriages implode because they didn't actually have deep friendships outside the marriage they mm. they picked up this idea that they were now meant to be fully self-contained fully self-sufficient emotionally mm. as a couple and that's a lot of pressure to put on one other person on the planet that becomes at some point a form of idolatry i'm sure too you, 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 because so many of our idols are not just little statues but they're mm. good things that we think have become the thing, you know. So, Sam, going back to what you said earlier about the original creation design, we were really designed for this relationship. I find it interesting, too, that in, in reading the creation account, um, as God's going through the process of creating these different things in his world, uh, and uh, at some point he says, it's not good for man to be alone. And and it, it's it's not that God is saying I did something wrong. It's it's more He's saying, it's like an artist, He's saying, mm, I think that needs a little more of this, and and, it, and a little more color, or a little more shape, or whatever it is, because He looked at, at His creation and He He, he saw that, uh, you know, the uh, the man just wouldn't be satisfied having having a, a, a talk and a chat with the uh, giraffe and the and the uh, aardvark. It was just not going to do. And uh, so he created uh, uh, a friend before he really in a, in a beautiful way, didn't he? He did. And it, it, it shows what a lie it is when people say that, you know, the man is meant to be self-contained emotionally and not be able to need anyone else and that kind of thing. Um, I think it was I heard a sermon once by Tim Keller where he said Adam's insufficiency by himself is not a sign that he was imperfect but a sign that he was perfect um mm -hmm. that actually he was perfectly designed for friendship and therefore that sense of it not being right for him to be on his own is that that's a sign that we've been made well not a sign that we've been made badly i love that idea that's right yeah thoughtfully fearfully wonderfully uh, designed in this way and and what a 
a great dynamic it adds to our uh, experience of life and reality mm. to actually have friends and friends of, of different kinds and, and different levels in different categories as well, uh, you know, is, is so. But now, what t talk about this for a second. Uh, uh, would you consider yourself more of an introvert or an extrovert and how does that affect your friendships or relationships, Sam? Yeah, I, I've i normally said that I'm an introvert. I'm not I don't think that's entirely true. Um, I love company. I love small amounts of, of yeah, I, I prefer time with a small number of people that I know well. Um, but mm -hmm. COVID has actually shown me, I actually, I don't massively like being completely on my own for, for great lengths of time. I, I would much rather have familiar company than, than be completely on my own. Yeah. But on the flip side, I, I don't want to be around hordes of strangers either. So yeah. I may be an ambivert or whatever we are, something that's kind of on the, on the borderline. <laughs> well, sometimes people in this this COVID period will say, how was your week? And I'll say, it was so exciting. You, you, yeah, because I'm more of an extrovert, to be honest. I I had I had the greatest adventure. I drove to the Kroger parking lot and they brought my <laughs> groceries out. And that just shows how desperate I am to, you know, to get out from the four walls and see some yeah. other people. But uh, as, a, as I may have said earlier uh, in our, our chat, we, you know, my wife is more of the introvert who has to function as an extrovert, but she refuels uh, herself by, by really being uh, more to herself or just the two of us or, or maybe a friend or two. Um, let's talk for a second, too, about um, obstructions to uh, friendships and relationships um, uh, so, sometimes we probably all go through periods of time in our lives where uh, we don't want to let others in for one reason or another. Uh, we don't want them to see who we are. We're, perhaps we're fearful uh, that they won't uh, love us or that they won't mm -hmm. like us. Um, ha have you moved in and out of periods of time like that? And and uh, what would you say to somebody? As you, you certainly have served as a pastor on, on churches at churches before. How would you pastorally um, uh, counsel someone along those lines who's having difficulty with uh, uh, opening up, so to speak? Yeah, it's it's a it's something I've really grown in my appreciation of over the years, and just seeing how life-giving and spiritually vital it is to have people that you can open up to. Um, I think I, for many years, had, had friends that I thought were really good friends, but we never really kind of opened up about weaknesses or vulnerabilities. And if anyone ever did, even to a small extent, it normally meant that they were kind of mocked or mm -hmm. people kind of made light of it or got awkward about it. Mm. And then as I've I've kind of found friends where actually – where you can be completely open and completely honest, I suddenly realized just it's a totally different league. Mm. <laughs> um, and I don't think it's just a matter of personal preference or temperament. Um, you know, James does say in James 5, confess your sins. Not We're not just to confess our sins to God, although we are. We do obviously need to do that. Yeah. But he says, confess your sins to one another. That's right. Yeah. So a, a question I, I want to ask any Christian is, who is there in your life that you are actually confessing sins to? Mm. And who is there whose who's confession of sins you're able to receive and hear? Yeah. And a verse that's, that's come to mean a lot, I know that at, at the church I'm at in Emmanuel, Nashville, is 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have mm. fellowship with one another and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that, that sense that when we're actually honest with each other, that is when we really have fellowship. Mm -hmm. And that is when the the cleansing power of the blood of Christ becomes a felt reality. Because if I if I confess some, you know, really vile sin to you um, and you don't throw your hands up in horror and abandon me and mm -hmm. condemn me, but actually model and channel the grace of God to me, yeah. which may be through, you know, both assuring of forgiveness and, and some challenge as well, I'm sure. It actually makes me think oh, this grace suddenly becomes a bit more real. Yeah. 
um, because I'm 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 experiencing it at the horizontal level in a, in a way that strengthens my understanding of how it works at a vertical level. We yeah. deeply in our hearts find it very difficult to believe that God actually really does forgive us. Um, mm-hmm. I know you've recently read, because I think you were tweeting through lots of it, uh, Dane Ortland's book, Gentle and Lowly. Oh, yeah. Uh, but that, that's a book that really helped me to see God's heart for, for us as we come to him in our, in our neediness. And the more we can do that with one another, again, mm-hmm. that fosters really deep friendship. And yeah. it means we're not constantly tiptoeing around one another going, that person must never know this and that person must never know that. Um, it's it's actually liberating and relieving to have that kind of honesty. That's what I was going to say too. I, I emphasize that freedom of grace uh, experienced um, in relationships. That doesn't mean um, I, I, a few years back I was on a men's retreat and, and they did uh, the they quoted the verse from James chapter five there. And then they proceeded to see if they could top one another in confessing their sins and how heinous and, oh, you did that. OK, well, I did this, you know, and, and yeah. it sort of got into a, can you top this thing? And really what we want to get to, though, is the freedom of grace and, mm. and being able to um, to do that might mean I don't publicly broadcast to the entire world as a performance. Yeah. <laughs> how just how wretched I am, uh, but that I find a friend or two or, or or three, whatever it may be. And we see this with Jesus, don't we, with his disciples. Mm. He seemed to be a little closer to the three, Peter, James, and John, than he was to the 12, and perhaps the 12 more than he was to the 70, and, and, and on and on, right? So we, yeah. we have a, perhaps we have a capacity for um, layers and levels of friendship, but the question is, you know, do we have? Uh, I liked your question. Do we do we have any that we yeah. could actually confess our sins to? And I, I think I have to say, for for um, you know, my in my own experience, uh, leadership sometimes can be lonely in that regard. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not always sure as a pastor. Who can you talk to and and be bluntly honest with? Mm. Um, I, I thank God for my my wife, of course, and then my beyond that, my church council, uh, which th- they're the deepest of friends and and mm. the kind that we can be, you know, really blunt and honest with, and and uh, it's been good, really good and healthy for us that way. Um, also, wanted to talk then about. Uh, Biblical examples for just a couple minutes, and mm. um, there are uh, some relationships in the in the Bible that we see that are actually broken or that that come to a, a moment of impasse, if you will. Paul and Barnabas over John Mark, mm. right? Yeah. Um, uh, Paul writes to the the two ladies, uh, what were their names, uh, Euodia and Syntyche, I think, and asking mm-hmm. them sort of, hey, could you patch that up a little bit? I'm, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm hearing I'm hearing a little bit too much of this is going on and. Uh, but but uh, uh, even among the disciples of Jesus, we have this sort of who's going to be the greatest. Mm. And the mother and, and the one mom comes in and goes, I want my boys on either side of you, Jesus, when you <laughs> come in your kingdom, you know. And and so uh, what obstructions do we have? Do we have the same? Is this like a timeless thing, Sam? Is this the human condition that keeps us from becoming good friends? Yeah, well, we're, we're trying to live out a genesis 2 template in a genesis 3 world aren't we so however much we we believe the the design god has for friendship uh you know we're we're still sinners and we still want to make it about us and again that that's one that's another reason why i think having people you can confess sins to is so healthy because it it's it's constantly resetting the fact that you're not trying to make your impressiveness the basis of that person's friendship towards you um so yeah i think there's always going to be struggles sometimes friendships fall apart sadly sometimes there can be reconciliation in in this life sometimes sadly there can't and that the new testament anticipates that as you say we, we see examples even of of apostles falling out and having to part company or whatever it might be. And I love the the way, 
I was going to say, I love the way that the Lord uh, superintends over all of that anyway, because Paul and Barnabas separate, and we end up with not one, but two missionary teams going out, right? Yes, yes. So so we can look back in the rearview mirror. We see we, we see things actually much better than we do in the windshield, even though that doesn't make any sense, does it? No, no, it's wonderful. I love, I love how God does that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and the other thing is that we... We just seek day by day to to grow into people who are more and more like Jesus. So mm-hmm. hopefully over the, the long term trajectory of our lives, we are becoming better at this. And, mm. you know, again, going back to, to Jesus himself calling us his friends, the more we lean into his friendship, the more we will be that kind of friend to other people. Uh, when, when you receive that kind of friendship, from Jesus, you're able to express and to be that kind of friend wow. more and more to others. So that, that's, that's right. got to be the key, hasn't it? It does. Um, so it, it, maybe bringing this all around uh, toward uh, an end as well for, since we don't have, all, I wish we could go on a long time, but um, there's a missional aspect to all of this too, isn't it? The watching world, um, seeing or watching the body of Christ uh, you know, we so often hear that they, you know, look at the church and it's just full of hypocrites. And I'm always saying, well, the world is full of hypocrites. I don't know anyone mm-hmm. that isn't a hypocrite. There were, we're all saying one thing and doing another, but, but, and we're all pretending or posing in some way. But I, but I wonder if the world looked at the church and saw uh, redemption at work and mm-hmm. saw the gospel. Um, working in in the relate real relationships of people and have a community not just you know one or two people but an entire community isn't there a missional aspect to this isn't it that you know this has purpose even greater and 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 further and beyond our own uh needs i think so i'm just looking at that verse in in first corinthians 14 where the outsider walks in and says you know surely God is really among you. And I think part of that is when we are being real with each other and where that kind of honesty and grace and forgiveness is all very tangibly evident because it's going to be so unlike, sadly, the rest of the world that we live in. And and things are trending so much in a direction that is more and more angry and outragey and accusatory that to have a community that imperfect but nevertheless really is modeling grace and being known will Mm. will, i think shine very very brightly indeed and i think it will be i think it will be compelling very compelling oh that's great well sam thank you so much for for joining us today. And, and uh, this is, uh, I think I may have mentioned to you earlier, this is uh, what we're calling Friday Night Chats. And it, there's an S there because we think we're going to do it again. And I'm, I'm, I'm scheduled to talk with Oz Guinness next month. So I'm, I'm really looking forward oh, to that. Wow. It'll be a different subject altogether, but I know he's a friend of yours as well. And uh, looking forward to that. Uh, but, but this has just been great. And I'm looking forward to having you back here in the United States. And uh, to, you know, to you and and all of our friends at Emmanuel Nashville, uh, we're we're. I hope that we as churches together in the same city can just mm-hmm. continue to uh, to not only uh, experience the love of Christ uh, ourselves uh, on a vertical mm-hmm. level, but be able to horizontally uh, uh, experience that as well, and and have that be a witness to the watching world. So thank you, you so know, much. Sam. Likewise, I, I'm looking forward to grabbing Thai food with you, and I'm I'm next back in the in the shire and i know that the folks at emmanuel love you and love the ministry and the all that's going on at the chapel there so yeah i look forward to that god bless you thank you thank you